by comparing the behavior and cognition of different animal species with a special focus on one of our closest living relatives, chimpanzees. He aims to uncover what aspects of human behavior and cognition are unique and which aspects are shared with other animals. This is quite an interesting, uh, important new branch of research that has a huge, huge um, impact on philosophy, on biology, on psychology. And um, um, Jan, the floor is yours. He promised uh, a speech about exactly 19 minutes. <laughs> this is what I learned from him. And after that, of course, we will have the, the opportunity to uh, uh, get into a Q&A with each other. Please. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the, for the nice introduction. And thank you for being here. So I want to share some of our most recent research findings with you, and I want to sort of highlight both similarities and differences when it comes to trust in humans and trust in non-human animals. And I'll mostly focus on, on chimpanzees, as you have just heard, one of our closest living relatives. But maybe just first uh, a little bit of background about the sort of kind of discipline that I'm very fortunate to be in. So, so I'm a comparative psychologist. And as psychologi comparative psychologists, we have the sort of great task of finding out what differentiates human psychologies from the psychologies of other animals. So there literally are people who run experiments to figure out how do giraffes think? What do giraffes feel? And how are giraffes' thoughts and giraffes' feelings different from the kind of feelings that we as humans have, and in which ways are they similar? And actually, it was kind of introduced as a very new topic, comparative psychology, but I would argue that this tendency to compare humans to other animals has very, very deep historic roots. So I, I have a quote up here, which is from Aristotle, so more than 2,000 years ago. And the quote itself is not that important, but pay attention to how Aristotle starts here. For the real difference between humans and other animals is that. So I think this tendency to compare humans to other animals has very, very deep historic roots. I would even say people have started doing it when they started thinking. But when Aristotle thought about humans and other animals, Aristotle had a real disadvantage. And the disadvantage was that there were no apes, there were no monkeys in Greece at that time. So when Aristotle compared humans to other animals, he compared humans to sheep, goat, cows. And nothing against sheep, goats, or cows, but they don't tend to be the smartest animals. So in Aristotle's time, the gap between humans and other animals seemed huge. And this only really changed, at least in European thinking, when, you know, the first great apes came to Europe. This was, happened in zoos in, you know, around the 19th century for the first time, and then really changed when Jane Goodall, who many of you have heard about probably, um, really started studying chimpanzees in the wild in Tanzania. So what many comparative psychologists do today is to compare humans to the other great apes. And this is, I'm sure you all remember this, just a short reminder from, uh, from your biology class. So these are our four closest living relatives. So these are all great ape species. So orangutans, gorillas, humans, bonobos, and chimpanzees. And maybe just one important point, these are apes, not monkeys. So people often come to me and say, oh, you work with monkeys, right? And I'm like, no apes. So these are apes. Um, baboons, for example, are monkeys. And the main way to differentiate apes from monkeys um, is by noting whether they have a tail. So unfortunately, we lost our tail, as you can see at some point. Um, none of the great ape species have tails. Most monkeys do have tails. So that's a, that's a simple way to distinguish them. And maybe the main sort of result that has come out of comparing humans to other great ape species is just how intelligent other great ape species are. 
and I'm sure you have seen many examples of this in the media about animal intelligence, but I just want to show you my, my favorite example uh, real quick, which is a study that was done by some colleagues of mine at the Max Planck Institute, not far away from Leipzig, um, with chimpanzees in Uganda, on a small Ugandan island. Uh, um, yeah, a different kind of island than we heard about before, all that maybe um, all, all, you also see a mesh here. So I, I'm actually going to put you to test here, okay? So, so please, please uh, pay attention from now on. So this is the kind of setup where we run our behavioral experiments. They're all non-invasive, they're all voluntary. So here this chimpanzee just came in. You can see the context is one where there's maybe some straw on the ground. The chimpanzees have access to water. There, you know, there are some boxes, some ropes on the ground. The chimpanzees can use all of that stuff. And then here's the task. Maybe this is hard for you to see, but there's a little peanut here at the bottom of this very narrow tube. And chimpanzees love peanuts. So they will do everything to get a peanut. But as you can see, the peanut is at the very bottom, and the tube is very narrow, so you can't just put your hands in. Okay, now the question for you, what do you do? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, so I think 50% of adults solve this task, and 20% uh, of kids, or something like this. This is the first time that this chimpanzee has, this chimpanzee is called Yoyo, has seen this task, and then, then see what she does. So this completely spontaneous problem solving. There was no training involved the first time that they're exposed to this. So this requires quite advanced understanding of physics, for example. You have to understand that, that a peanut can float. And I'm just going to play it briefly to the end, um, just to see that Yo-Yo uh, is successful here. OK, so now she gets it. But then I also just very briefly um, want to show you the example of one of my favorite chimps there. So this is Oketch, and Oketch is known among all the researchers and the caregivers on the island for being very lazy, but also pretty innovative. And you can be lazy if you're innovative, so um, Oketch knows really well that he needs to go and get the water to be successful, but he's, he's lazy, as I said, so, so here's his solution. So a lot of differences, a lot of similarities between humans and chimpanzees, but disgust um, is not quite as uh, developed in chimpanzees, I would say. So th these are all examples of individual intelligence, right? The chimpanzee is here on their own trying to solve a problem. But we also know that chimpanzees are an extremely social species. Um, and now this brings me to, to really talking about trust. So, um, chimpanzees live in very large mixed-sex social groups. So in one group, for example, a group that lives in Budongo Forest in Uganda, the group has 150 individuals. And chimpanzees have individual relationships with each other in this group of 150 individuals. So they have really advanced social intelligence. By the way, there's a new, um, not that I want to uh, do advertising for Netflix, but there's a new quite good Netflix documentary called uh, Chimpanzee Empire, which is filmed with this group of chimpanzees. And although the story is not that compelling, it's some of the best footage of chimpanzees I've ever seen. Um, so yeah, I, I can recommend it. So chimpanzees live in these large mixed-sex social groups, and they also show various forms of cooperation. So I've just put up a couple of examples here. So this is grooming. This is maybe something many of you have heard about. This is this behavior to remove parasites from one another's fur. And it doesn't only have a hygienic function, but also a relationship building function. So if I want to become friends with you, for example, what I'll do is I'll groom you. And we see that friends preferentially groom each other, for example. 
Chimpanzees also engage in collaborative hunting. So they hunt, for example, monkeys, and then they engage in some sharing of the meat after the hunt. And, and this maybe is the form of cooperation for chimpanzees that involves most trust. They also engage in these collaborative border patrols. So chimpanzees are very territorial, and there are a lot of hostile intergroup interactions in chimpanzees. So from time to time, what they'll do is they'll, they'll gang up and they'll patrol their territory. And these are very, very high stakes, high intensity situations where chimpanzees really have to rely on one another. I would argue they have to trust one another here. So what we are interested in our research is finding out whether it's really trust that underlies chimpanzee cooperation. So the main question that I want to uh, talk about for the reminder is, do chimpanzees trust each other? Can we say that chimpanzees, just like humans, form trusting relationships? And as you can imagine, that's maybe not the easiest um, study to, uh, or question to study, because we can't just ask chimpanzees, right? In humans, trust is mostly studied using language, um, but that's, of course, not something we can do here. So what we did first is we looked at how do people study trust in humans. And one of the main game um, is the so-called trust game. This has been developed by economists, and economists have used this game to, tr to study trust across multiple different societies. And I'm not going to go into details here, but just very briefly, the idea is that you have a player A and you have a player B, and the question is, will player A entrust his or her money to player B? So this sort of is an experimental version of the real world experience that probably many of you have had before, wondering, can I, when I lend you some money, when you lend money to a friend, can I trust them to pay it back? And what we try to do is to develop an experiment that basically has, that same, has the same features as the human trust game. And we call this experiment the trust game for chimpanzees. We don't use money, we use food. But I would argue that for chimpanzees, food is basically like money for us. It's definitely, or it's one of the resources that they value most. So you'll notice there's also here, let's say, a player A and a player B, so two individuals interacting, and they're in, in different rooms opposite of one another. And we're really interested in this chimpanzee's behavior. And this chimpanzee, can pull one of two ropes. They can either pull the trust rope or, sorry, the no trust rope or the trust rope. Now, if she pulls the no trust rope, she just gets immediate access to food. This is low quality food. So this is like a mix of oranges and lemons. So this is something that chimpanzee will eat, but that they're not particularly crazy about. Alternatively, this chimpanzee can decide to pull the trust rope. Now, if she pulls the trust rope, this box with very nice food, apples and bananas, moves to the other chimpanzee. So food moves away from them. Then this chimpanzee can eat some of the food, and then they can prove trustworthy by sending the food back to the first chimpanzee, or they can prove untrustworthy by just keeping all of the food for themselves. So this is very similar to, to lending money to someone else, right? You don't know what they're going to do. You don't know whether they're going to prove trustworthy or not. And using this setup, what we found is that chimpanzees showed a very high likelihood of pulling the trust rope when there was a chimpanzee in, another, in the other room compared to, to when there was no chimpanzee. So this presents some of the first evidence that chimpanzees actually trust each other that just like humans, chimpanzees can form these trusting relationships. A second main question that we're interested in was whether chimpanzees trust some chimpanzees more than others. So just like in humans, we might place special trust in our friends, right? We might trust them with more money, for example, or with more resources. So here we wanted to ask the same. Do chimpanzees place special trust in their friends? So first, we had to find out who the friends are in chimpanzees. 
And then, and this was, um, I think, one of the highlights of my PhD about 10 years ago, I spent 320 hours just sitting next to a chimpanzee group. So here you, you can see an example of what this looked like. I just, yeah, for 320 hours, had the chance of just observing chimpanzees. And I would note down, like, who is sitting close to whom, who is grooming whom, who is sharing food with whom. And based on these data, we could then say, well, these two seem to be pretty good friends. These two don't seem to be such good friends. So just to you know, make this a little bit more specific, what we found, for example, is that Akela was very good friends with Jane. They were often grooming. They often shared meat. But Akela felt quite neutral about Tess. So they, they weren't close friends. And then we went back to our trust game, and we looked at if Akela is making a decision about whether to pull the trust rope or the no-trust rope, and Jane is in the other room, does that influence her behavior differently compared to when Tess is in the other room? And that's exactly what we found. So we found that chimpanzees were much more likely to pull this trust rope when there was a friend in the other room compared to when there was a non-friend in the other room. And I've you know, just given you a little glimpse of that research. Um, there, this chimpanzee trust has been studied using other kind of experiments in different kinds of chimpanzee populations. And what all of this, this research suggests, that chimpanzees, like humans, trust each other. They can form these trusting relationships. And also, just like humans, chimpanzees trust some individuals more than others. They seem to place special trust in their friends. So this was about similarities between chimpanzee and human trust. Now I have one more final slide, which is about some differences between human and chimpanzee trust. Can you just look, look around you a little bit, sort of who's sitting next to you? Like, who, who, who is with you in this room? Probably there are quite a few people sitting right next to you who you have never met before. There are quite a few strangers to you in this room, right? And from an evolutionary perspective, this is absolutely amazing. We take this completely for granted, but from an evolutionary perspective, this is just amazing. So I, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about chimpanzees and how chimpanzees live, and then I go out of my apartment in San Francisco, and I'm surrounded by all these strangers, and I, it's, it's just amazing from an evolutionary perspective, because there's no other great ape species that has evolved the capacity for peaceful, trusting interactions with strangers. So the fact that as humans we can trust strangers, we can form trusting relationships with strangers at banks, in airports, at hospitals, is just mind-blowing from an, from an evolutionary perspective. If you want to read more about this, I can really recommend this book, The Company of Strangers, that really talks about the evolutionary history behind this and, and how humans, what kind of factors allow humans to form trusting relationships with people they have never met before and they will probably never meet again. With this, I want to thank the organizers very much for inviting me here and thank you all so much for coming. So, um, I have a lot of questions, but I'm sure you too have questions. Please, it's up to you. Where's our green cube here? This is the microphone. So let me ask you one thing. What is the evolutionary effect that this human capacity of building trust with unknown members of our species that makes us Obviously, it's an, it's an advantage, an evolutionary advantage. What would you think makes it such an advantage? Um, yeah, I would say the, the main advantage of trusting strangers is that cooperation is more powerful 
if you can cooperate on a large scale. So if you're restricted to the people who, for example, live in your group, the people in your community, your cooperation is really going to be restricted. You can build up an army. Exa for example, yeah. That's, it also has, of course, uh, sort of potentially bad consequences, yeah. but you know you can also, um, uh, what would be an example, you can build complex technology that can help many people, and technology develops much faster the more people collaborate uh, on it. So, yeah, I think, so what's, what's really special about human cooperation compared to chimpanzee cooperation, for example, and here's another example of chimpanzee cooperation, is that it's flexible, Humans cooperate in all domains of life. I, I often ask people, can you tell me one aspect of your everyday life where you don't rely on others? And I don't think any of us can. Like, you know, even going to the bathroom, you rely on people who have built the toilets and so on. So we are an extremely cooperative species, very flexible, and we cooperate large scale. And, and yeah. this kind of trusting strangers allows cooperation at a large scale. Now, for trust, there's a time factor. Trust is a sustainable thing. As you mentioned, it's friendship, like friendship. What mm. makes chimpanzees build up friendships? Is it um, like uh, we are friends, we come from the same corner, family? Uh, what, 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 what makes chimpanzees make each other friends or not? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. We have, we have done some research on it. So, does anyone know what the main factor that determines whether two humans become friends is? What's the strongest causal factor? <laughs> Smell? It's close. Uh, proximity. Physical proximity. You need to be close to someone, you need to meet them regularly in order to form friendships. And yeah, so the two things that we've heard, smell and age, they, they're actually extremely important in chimpanzees. So chimpanzees are more likely to form friend, make friends with individuals that are of a similar age, and actually also who have a similar personality to them. And this is also something that we see um, in humans. And then. So basically what you see in this picture right now, that's probably a friendship in the making. So it's this kind of grooming, as I've mentioned before, that's really one of the main ways in which chimpanzees become friends. Okay, so we have highly differentiated social life in these yeah. groups of 150 or yeah. 100 to 150. Um, but now what uh, the difference is this large scale uh, confidence and trust building. Um, I see uh, your question, uh, uh, but now uh, what makes people, what makes the human species capable of, uh, of establishing these large-scale trust? Is it language? Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I would say it's, it's two things that allow human, or two things are discussed mostly in the literature, that allow humans to cooperate on such a large scale. The one is a form of language, people gossip, and institutions. So gossip is very important because, again, f gossip has a kind of negative reputation, but from an evolutionary perspective, gossip is extremely important because it allows us to learn about the reputation of people that we have never interacted with before. I mean, and it's even if we have share gossip, it's not only about the, the third one. Yeah. We build a community exactly. while sharing. Yeah. 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 So this may, some people in the, liter in the field say that what they're doing here is kind of like humans gossiping. Because we become friends through gossiping, through sharing our evaluations of what happened. And through gossip, I also learn from you who I can trust and who I cannot trust, even though I've never met that person. And, and the second main factor, I would say, is institutions. So, so many people say that in modern large-scale societies, we actually don't need to trust the other person we only need to trust the institution. So we need to trust, for example, the you know, legal system um, uh, that, um, uh, yeah, that this person will, will behave according to our rules and norms and standards because we have a legal system in place. We just had this morning a discussion about transferring trust as a personal relationship yeah. to a large-scale mass society and yeah, yeah. political state yeah. where the institutions come into the game. Yeah, yeah. We have a question here. Yeah. Right in the... <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, uh, thank you for an amazing speech. And maybe I would like to make a bridge to the previous discussion and uh, ask about institutions or institutes, uh, institutes of healing the trust. And maybe you have some experience uh, in uh, this comparative uh, research between uh, species, different species, human and non-human, uh, in terms of this healing the trust after something happened what didn't should happen. Yeah, yeah. I, and maybe this, uh, the, we understand how uh, we can uh, develop uh, friendship, for example, but how to heal and uh, how it works in different uh, situations with different species. Yeah. yeah, thanks. There's there's unfortunately no research, to my knowledge, on this, on how chimpanzees recover from distrust. I can just tell you that, if, now this is just anecdotally based on having observed, chimp having spent many hours observing chimpanzees, there are definitely situations in chimpanzee daily life that look very much like trust has broken down. So f I can just give you one example of an interaction that I observed, which was that one chimpanzee, let's say me, was attacked by a different chimpanzee, um, and then I asked for help from my friend, from you, and the friend failed to help. The friend just walked away and didn't help me. And this led a to a complete breakdown in our social relationship. Um, but it was so interesting for me to see what the chimpanzee who failed to help, how he behaved in the next days and weeks, because he really invested in the relationship again. So you would come to me all the time and groom me again and share meat with me and so on. So to me, it kind of looked like a chimpanzee apology in a way. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the only thing I can say there, I think. May I ask one question, please? Uh, no, no, sorry. Yeah. Yours. It's your turn. Um, I'm internally laughing uh, about this uh, trust in society because I come from Finland. And uh, I learned uh, to build a society together. And uh, we are quite happy and trusting about our society. But we are driving on two wagons at the same time. I know how to prepare uh, food for winter. I know how to fish on ice. I know how to build a cottage. <laughs> I have to know in case everything falls down. And uh, I was telling this to my friend, and uh, we were in Austria with a coffee and cake, and there was a colleague artist building a house with her own hands. And, and uh, uh, she said, yeah, and then I built a shed. If the house burns down, then I can sleep in the shed. And then if the shed burns down, I can sleep in the boathouse. And I was like, yeah, that makes total sense. <laughs> and all, all the Austrians were like, huh? these people are, uh, make no sense whatsoever. But for us, it's clear that, OK, the society, uh, the, there will be some gamma wave or whatever. Uh, society as it is, is so vulnerable. We need to still know <laughs> how, to, how to do the other stuff alone. We must trust the society, or at least pretend to trust. And I, w I want to be urban, international, fantastic, and uh, be part of a society. But I also have to know how to do everything uh, really by, my, by myself. Do chimp <laughs> what, is, a, is a lonely chimpanzee a chimpanzee? Because if I'm, I'm a lonely person, am I a person? <laughs> hmm. I would say a lone chimpanzee is a dead chimpanzee. So chimpanzees cannot survive on their own. So when they get separated from their group, they can maybe survive for a couple of days or weeks, but they cannot really survive long term on their own. What kills them? It can be a number of different things, but it's often other groups that will kill that chimpanzee. So they're, 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 in chimpanzees, they're only extremely hostile intergroup interactions. So there are no examples of two chimpanzee groups together and having a peaceful interaction. 
This is actually different in bonobos. So I didn't really talk about bonobos a lot, but our other closest living relatives, who um, yeah, probably many of you have heard about uh, a lot as well, they haven't been studied as much as chimpanzees because they only live in the Democratic Republic of Congo in an area that is extremely hard to access. Um, so one of my colleagues works there, but you first need to get a private plane, then you're on a boat for six days, and then you need to walk for four hours, and then you get to the bonobos. So it's just hard to study them. But what's fascinating about them is that in bonobos, you actually see peaceful intergroup interactions. So when different groups of bonobos come together, they actually groom each other, they have sex, they share food, and so on. So that's, that's a major difference there. Thank you very much. You strengthened my uh, internal <laughs> uh, view that uh, uh, we and the chimps are the assholes of creation. And, and uh, we, we should mate with orangutans to become better ourselves uh, and bonobos. So we and the chimps, we, we didn't work out. It, it's no good. We, we should go the other, other ways on the tree of life. Thank you. We have one more question here in the third row. And thank you for the interesting speech. And I have two questions. The first one is, maybe I missed a point. And what is the result of the tests with three chimpanzees that you met with Tess, Jane, and Akira? Yeah. 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 And they shared the food or not with specific one? And the second one is maybe a little bit of out, out of tema, because um, uh, a few months ago, I saw the film, The Symbiotic Earth. It's based on the Lynn Magles. Uh, research about the symbiotic uh, living beings in, on the earth and through this film I got another perspective of every living beings on this planet we should be like I mean everybody should be like symbi sim sim how can I say in English symbiot um, like symbiotic connections and trust building so that we can live on this planet like more effectively and I thought that after this film like maybe it's, we should be like trust each other in the symbiotic way so I mean through this film I want to ask about um, your researches maybe about apes or chimpanzees is there any trust building or uh, interspecies actions between between them or like species, like about trust building or interactions, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So f for, the, for the first question, yeah, what we found is that um, when we paired Akela with her friend Jane, Akela was much more likely to pull this trust rope. So Akela was much more likely to hand the resource, the food over to Jane, probably because she was expecting Jane to be trustworthy, compared to when she was interacting with Tess then she was more likely to go to the no-trust rope and just do her own thing and not share this food um, uh, with Tess. So that was the main finding of that study. So th th the summary is just chimpanzees like humans seem to trust their friends more than neutral individuals. They didn't pull the ropes like randomly, but really specific. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. And with regard to your second uh, point, I unfortunately don't know that theory very well, so I can't really, can't really say much about that. But you were also asking about um, trusting interspecies interactions. And I would say there, there, these examples abound. I think so many people who work on a daily life with animals and who rely on animals have deep trust in these animals. So I would say, yeah. And that, that's actually also a field within comparative psychology that more and more people are starting to study. So these interspe interspecies forms of cooperation, to what extent are they similar to and to what extent are they different from two humans cooperating with one another? One last question. Hello, thank you for the, the speech. I have a question about the border patrol uh, and the war. So I think I read that they make a lot of wars, but how do they finish war? <laughs> and it, does it also mean that they are only always in the same group? So genetically, it seems uh, not so good <laughs> mm -hmm. to be in two small groups. Sometimes you need the blood of uh, another group to be stronger, so yeah. how, it's, how is it working and how is ending war for it? Um, okay, I'll start with the more negative, oh, I mean, yeah, the, or maybe I'll start with the more positive one. So there is exchange between groups, 
but exclusively female chimpanzees who are teenagers transfer between groups. So that is the only example where chimpanzees go from one group to another. So mostly at around 11 or 12 years of age, female chimpanzees will try to join another group. And this is often a process that can take weeks, so it's a very, very stressful experience. But that's the one example where also genetic transfer happens to avoid inbreeding. And how do, how do these kind of warlike situations end? Well, they mostly end with the bigger group of chimpanzees beating the smaller group of chimpanzees, taking over some of their territory, and even killing a member of the other group, and then also eating that member. Maybe, now, this was a bad ending, I feel. Really okay. bad, <laughs> bad ending. But important just to, to learn, this is not an idyllic thing that we are talking about. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Now, how do I connect to the next point? It's lunch. <laughs> well, well, sharing meat in chimpanzees is one of the main ways of forming friendships, so maybe we can share okay. some lunch we, we, to also... We share some lunch. Yeah. Please give a big hand to Jan Engelmann. Thanks for coming, and um, uh, we have an interesting book uh, hint and uh, the Netflix thing, not yeah. to forget. We have lunch break now, and then we invite you cordially to the final round uh, at the Maschinensaal at what time? 2 p.m. We see each other for the final discussion. Thanks. Bye-bye.